Hello, my name is Jeffrey Fletcher. I'm a writer director and I'm honored to be speaking with Trayvon today about Two Distant Strangers. Hello, Trayvon. Hey, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for doing this, man. My pleasure. When I saw it, uh, I was so, uh, I felt a lot of different things. And uh, in addition to, to entertained, uh, you go through uh, quite, quite the gamut of emotions. And, um, you know, I, I, I want to congratulate you on, you know, handling that difficult tonal balance, you know, so masterfully. You. And, you know, just to ask you, first of all, you know, how all of the attention uh, feels, all the, the, the positive attention that, that you've received. Oh, man, um, it, it feels, you know, especially for a project like this, it feels really good because this is something that I've always felt like was so much bigger than myself and all the people involved because of who it's for and what it represents. And so, you know, it feels great to know that people are not only seeing me, they're seeing the movie and they're feeling the movie and they're seeing, you know, the names in the movie. And <clears throat> that to me is what matters beyond anything that people remember the people that this story is about and carry that into the world. So it's been, it's been great for me professionally, but it's been really, really great to feel like people are connecting to this story and these issues. Hmm. And to the film's great credit, I don't think one could imagine the circumstances under which it was made. Uh, not only was it written in five days, put together in five months, but done under COVID. And what I'm really curious about is how those limitations may have helped you. Yeah, so, you know, it's because of the limitations of COVID that actually served creating a story that is so compact and so repetitious that mm. it doesn't require a lot of company moves and a lot of yeah. locations and a lot of the things that you know typically go along with, with filmmaking. And so it being confined to that limitation, especially at the time when I wrote it, there was no filming in Los Angeles. There was no ability to get a permit time so we didn't even know if we'd be able to even make the movie it was like we I wrote it and we had plans to direct it and we were chasing money but there was still no you know light at the end of that tunnel that was going to say yes you have permission to go shoot this and so it was really you know making a film that was so physical at a time when everyone was telling people to stay apart and needing permission to do that from SAG and from the LA permits people and uh, you know, having to come up with, having to find a company who was willing to sign off on a COVID plan for us to shoot the movie was really difficult. And you know, on top of that, having a crew and, and a group of people who are mostly brown and black who are the ones most affected by COVID. So putting our lives at risk to just make the film. Uh, it was so much going on that we had to put in the front of our minds. We are storytellers and filmmakers. This story we feel like is the most important story to tell right now with what the world is going through right now. And so we put you know, all those other things aside and we took the risk and took a chance and we were able to find a company who would you know, sign off on uh, our film for, for SAG. And we, we were the first production, I believe, SAG allowed to shoot in Los Angeles. Mm. And they started giving out, you know, permits again. And um, it was very expensive to get that sign off from, you know, the, one of those medical companies. And uh, it ate up a lot of our budget, which had to make us even more resourceful because we were shooting the film without being completely funded and still chasing money while we were making it. And so, you know, at a time when people were also being more, you know, cautious with their spending, we were asking them for a relatively, you know, in terms of their wealth, a small amount of money, but, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a large amount of money. And so we, we just wouldn't take no's <laughs> for an answer. We just, we were going to find our yeses everywhere we can, and we were going to get 
you know, will this movie into existence in any way we could. And we found our way through August and we got to September with enough money to pay our bills through production. And, and we went right into it. And mm. COVID be damned, we, we tested every single day because mm. of the nature of our film. So everyone was testing every day of the shoot plus pre, before we even shot leading up to the shoot. Uh, we took it very seriously and we were very rigorous and nobody got sick. And that was mm. it. Even it's really, COVID, nobody got sick. That's, that's remarkable. And I know that, you know, you had other things on your mind before this. And it seems as if the times, you know, spoke to you or screamed at you. You know, oftentimes you hear so much, oh, this film had to be made. And, you know, it's almost a cliche. But here, <laughs> <laughs> finally, we see one where it's, you can't argue with that. Absolutely. I mean, it was, it involved making this movie. I challenge anyone, you know, in almost any film made last year or this year to to have had a more traumatic experience in the creation of the product. Because not only were we living it at the time of the story we were telling, you know, watching take after take of Joey be strangled or mm. be mm. shot, or, um, you know, even the rehearsals, like I found myself in tears so many times mm. because of a testament to the great actors that we had that it was so real and it watching it on a monitor didn't feel that different from watching those videos on my phone hmm. on a tv screen and you know we had to steal ourselves especially you know my other black producers who were on set some days against you know what we were doing and what we were watching every day because we were putting ourselves through this to make this movie and you know we would have check-ins like People, we would be texting each other, yo, man, you good? You all right? How you feeling? Mm. And it was, it was, you know, trauma while we were experiencing trauma at the time of what was happening in the country. And we were creating it ourselves for the greater good of telling this story and for people to connect to why we were experiencing that trauma in the first place. And so, you know, these things were at the forefront of our minds before George Floyd was murdered. And you know, that only crystallized those in the moment where, you know, as artists, we always are looking for how can we, how can we respond? What can I do in this moment to have an outlet for my feelings and my emotions? And, you know, this idea just was the perfect vehicle for how contained it was, how, how visceral it was, how simple it was for people to connect to, and how much it connected to the reality of not only what I was feeling, but with so many black Americans and brown Americans experienced, not just here, but all over the world and in the UK and Brazil in places where brown people are just constantly under attack by authority. And so it, it's a film that was not only difficult to make, but it has the benefit of connecting so broadly beyond our own borders. Mm -hmm. And I know that the script received a lot of interest early on and a script that is so re well received early, uh, a script of such ambition and power, was there ever a thought during the production, can we fulfill this promise? Yeah, there were, absolutely. There were so many, you know, over the course of the two months from writing to finished production, there were so many nights, you know, I spent wondering if we were making something that would just be such a, you know, a painful, rejected experience to not just the masses, but to black people in particular. And to, to could we do this, handle this very delicate subject matter in this very delicate story at this very, you know, sensitive time where the wound was still wide open. Um, and could we get people to connect to what we were trying to, to convey? And, you know, with stories like this and movies like this, you know, I think you probably know this is better, better than most, which is, you know, when you're writing a story about real people and real pain, especially about real black people, it can, it can be very hard to thread that needle mm -hmm. and make 
people connect to what you were trying to get them to connect to because you know while there is a black experience there's also 14 million different black experiences in this country as well and everyone is not going to get what we're trying to you know convey and so my hope was that i didn't find myself having asked all these people for help and put them in a position to be you know uh beat over the head about something that people just outright rejected for some reason that we either missed or we shot wrong or didn't take into consideration. And nothing, if any, of anything that happened, that's happened with this movie, nothing has made me happier than the fact that it, it landed, it, we threaded the needle and so many people have connected to it and understand it and feel the weight of it and the importance of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would agree. The uh, film itself is so precise and organic. I'm wondering if in the process of making it, were there discoveries or was it uh, largely, you know, let's just try to, to, to capture our original vision, but I'm just wondering what source of things came up that might've influenced uh, the, you know, the final film. Yeah, so, you know, in the beginning, in the very, very first draft I wrote, because I only really wrote two. <laughs> hmm. um, wow. The, what you see on screen is almost entirely the first draft of the script. Um, and the only thing that changed along the way was like, minor de minor dialogue changes when you hear someone say it on set you're like oh let's tweak this or change that but mm -hmm. um the the film in its first version ended less hopeful let's call it that without spoiling the end mm -hmm. it wasn't as as hopeful as it ends now and you know being in july at the time in the middle of all that all those protests and all the things we were feeling it it was a reflection of how I felt. It was a reflection of what I felt like we were going through and what I thought, you know, the future looked like for, for us. And then, you know, in thinking it over throughout that period of writing, it became an, a, a situation where I had to think about what do I not, I don't want people to feel like what I feel right now. What do I want them to feel going forward? What do I want them to feel, you know, how can I make this last beyond that moment? And it was to find a way to give people, you know, hope. And which is why the movie now ends the way it ends. And it was to inspire people to want to do something different. And after they felt, after they watched the film and to, to want to, you know, figure out a way to stop this phenomenon that, we experienced to stop it from occurring. And so there was the changing of the ending from hopeless to hopeful. And then, you know, throughout filming, we also found actually an edit. We actually found the shape of those last two and a half minutes, which, mm. you know, was, was very different on the page and how it actually played out, which was, you know, it, it originally ended at that uh, dinner table scene. And, you know, while we were kind of looking at it, we were like, you know, let's just get this other ending of Joey, you know, leaving <laughs> and, and having this moment uh, beyond the table conversation where, you know, it feels like he's moving into action. It feels like he's moving in the direction mm. of where we want to go versus it being a conversation that kind of just ends there. And that ended up being, you know, really, really, really great to have an edit because <laughs> it actually felt much better. It felt much more forward and much more energetic for him to, you know, experience what he experiences and then decides I'm going back again, you know? Mm. And, and that was, you know, probably the two biggest things that changed that we found throughout the creative process. Hmm. You know, I think a, a textured ending can be really satisfying 
even if it could be a little unsettling. Yeah. And you could also find a lot of hope in it, but it's, it's, it's hope through a, a, a certain, uh, a certain grim truth, but hope nonetheless. And I think that, you know, as opposed to a happy ending where everything's tied up in a bow in a, in a way that's a sad ending to me because <laughs> people want something, you know, they want some truth. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it just really sounds like a, a such a remarkable journey, such a, a whirlwind that uh, I, you, you wonder too, where some things I think are born in a bit of a blur. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if, if looking back on it now, if you have that feeling, like, what did I do? Or no. maybe not. <laughs> no, no, it really, I say, I say, me and Martin talk pretty much every day for, you know, mm -hmm. obviously for we're campaigning, but also because like, we're just friends who are working on many things together. And we both have that moment of like, dude, it's March. Mm -hmm. and like, like, we did this thing so fast and like, we, we had to do it so fast that it was hard to keep track of what we were doing when we were doing it mm. because the days were just so filled with phone calls, phone calls, emails, emails, raising money, raising money, getting like doing the thing that you didn't have time to really stop and overthink anything or yeah. overproduce anything or overcomplicate anything because time was not on your side. You had sometimes hours to make a decision about the entire that was going to affect the entire movie. And, and I think that helped us. Yeah. I think the ability to not have to overthink, to not, you know, lean, get too far away from the emotion of what we were doing to get into our like filmmaker analytical heads that it comes across on screen. You get an emotional film experience because that's what we felt like at the time. The movie's fast and it's emotional because we were working fast and we were emotional. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it, I literally have to think back and go through like, I'll sometimes type in days uh, in my phone fo uh, photo uh, album to see mm -hmm. what we were doing around mm -hmm. that time. If there's a photo or something that reconnects us to that point in time. And it really is, you know, I'm glad we have a lot of pictures and a lot of video from those those moments to to relive what we've forgotten in this whirlwind of just getting carried away by the movie and its response. Mm. And you know, I know it was well received before it was made, and there was interest in perhaps a feature version of it. Is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean, we we've gotten approached to do features, to do a feature of the movie. We've gotten approached to do like podcasts, all everyone has a has an idea on how to carry this story forward or versions of it forward or build a world around it, which we think is is great that people respond to the material that strongly. Um, and we definitely feel like, you know, everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, or a lot of people watch the movie and they are like, I want more <laughs> like we want more to this story i remember our first screening we ever did uh um where we like screened it for actual in its completed form um but keith stanfields uh said you know after it ended i wanted the story to keep going and that mm. was a huge compliment to to have that you know be said and it was a compliment that we found ourselves running into a lot where people were like, yes, more go. Like they want, they, Joey is so charismatic and the story puts him in such a, a great position that people are like, yeah, 28 minutes wasn't enough. I want, huh. I, want I want to keep, keep, I want to see where this goes. And that's the best going you can leave people with, which is wanting more. Absolutely. And please talk about the short film format and you know, what do you think some of the, was that an advantageous medium to work in for this story? Absolutely, man. I think, I'm so glad that the Academy not only has this category because a lot of, you know, lesser places don't. And I'm so happy that they acknowledge short filmmaking because, you know, it's a way for people like myself who, 
aren't big name filmmakers or, or established filmmakers to find an entry point into becoming filmmakers, someone who can, you know, carry a feature or direct a feature. And, you know, it's a great space for opening the door to, to new and young, uh, you know, brilliant creatives who somehow find themselves lucky enough to be on the short list or nominated or win a short film Oscar. And I'm so glad that I have the opportunity to make a short film that is a showcase of not only storytelling ability, but you know, of societal ills and societal story. And, and I think by having a category like this and promoting it, you inspire people to take risks. You inspire people to, to be bold and to be creative and to not feel the weight of having to create a 90 minute piece about an idea you have, but to tell a concise story that gives you the limitations you need to not overthink or overdo anything. And, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if I would have done this the same way without places like the Academy who, you know, encourage it. And I probably would have started with, you know, spending a year trying to make a feature, you know, like trying to do something mm. so much bigger that would have taken so much longer that would not have happened now so close to the moment. But because of the short film category and the, the Academy's, you know, uh, acceptance and promotion of it, it allowed me to respond to a thing I was feeling so quickly that mm. was tied to what society was feeling, what the world was feeling coming off the largest global protest ever and here we are, you know, seven months later with a finished film that's on the Academy shortlist that people are now watching and we're like, this very thing happened last summer. <laughs> yes. And I get to enjoy a piece of art connected to it, a, a piece of film. And, and that to me is just special. I think there is nothing more special than, especially from where I come from, giving people who don't typically have opportunities, opportunities. And I think that's what makes the short film category special. It's because we don't have the opportunity to just jump into the best picture race or the best screenplay race as up and coming filmmakers, but we can you know, create a quote unquote calling card that says, you know, here's what I'm capable of and here's why I deserve a seat at your table. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the beauty of the short film category and just short filmmaking in general. It's, it's allowing us to become Spike and Barry and Ava and Spielberg and Scorsese and all these people who we admire, who we look up to um, as filmmakers. It allows us to say, you know, hey, look what I can do. Maybe, maybe more people like me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, to inspire other people. And it's got to, maybe that's the biggest reward uh, of all. Um, also to that, to that same point though, it's, it's also great. Short film is also great. And it's great that the Academy acknowledges it because it can inspire people to create. And especially, you know, our film, I always call it the little miracle film because of how many miracles it took to get it made, to, for it to be here. And, you know, someone, me being like a black queer kid from Compton, I'm not supposed to be here. And yet I'm here and I've done this thing with the help of really great people. And someone is going to one day hear this conversation or read about the story of the inception of this movie and how you could write a movie in five days, almost fully funded in a month, shoot it in five days and find yourself, you know, on the Academy shortlist. Like it's, when you're a black writer or filmmaker up and coming and you have a desire to be where you or I are, you look for examples, you look to people who've done it or done something close to it. And I think, you know, it was the same way I felt when I met you, when I saw you win, it was, holy shit, like that's possible. Mm. 
Like mm-hmm. now it's been done. Now you, you, you shouldn't have turned me away before. Now you really have no excuse mm-hmm. because the mm-hmm. door has been broken open. Like now you have, you, you have to, you, you've acknowledged my presence. You've acknowledged the talent of my presence. So now you have no excuse. And so people can now look at what you've done, what I've done, what, what people who look like us are doing and they have so many examples. And you know, this category has not had a lot of examples from people who look like us. Yeah, indeed. And, and, and so it, it's great that, you know, there's some kid in, in Tennessee or New Jersey or Northern California with an iPhone that can make as great a film as you can make. I mean, they shoot in Dolby Vision now. <laughs> and, and, and that black kid or that brown kid boy, girl, trans, whatever, whatever they might be, um, can look at this and go, oh, I can do this. There's a path forward for me. And I think that's just a remarkable thing. Yeah, I agree. A thousand percent. And I wonder if the way to write a good film in five days is that is the way to do that to have lived it? Yeah. I think for me, the only reason that that was possible is because I'm a TV writer first and to be a TV writer is to have the ability to write roughly 30 pages in a week. <laughs> if you're a half hour comedy writer, or a half hour screenwriter, you roughly, you usually have a week to turn in your half hour script. So I was already conditioned and trained to be able to do that. It is not at all uh, a normal metric of writing and not at all something someone should put that weight on their shoulders. I've been doing this for years. And so I just have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. Take whatever time you need to get your story right and get it to where you want it to be. But if you, if you want to challenge yourself and go, you know, from, from, week, from the beginning of the week to the end of the week, I want to have this short film written because it doesn't have to be 30 pages. It doesn't have to be 35 pages. It could be 25 pages. It could be 20 pages. And I love to break scripts down by days when I know I have a target, hmm. uh, you know, page length or story that I have to execute whether I have an outline, it's this many scenes per day, or I know I want to get through this many pages per day if I got to turn it in on Monday. And that's so much easier than going, I need to write 35 pages in six days or five days. And that's just, you know, that was a thing that I came to this opportunity with and this idea with knowing that I was already capable of putting in that kind of work because I had already been trained and conditioned to do it. And so it only served the speed at which we needed to move anyway to be able to write a 30-ish page script in a week. Mm-hmm. The, uh, it seems to me that you're the type of writer that has, uh, works well with schedules and deadlines. Some writers are more emotional. They sort of ramp into things. Yeah. Uh, would you say that's the case with you? It's very right. disciplined? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it, it's a product of having been a daily show writer mm-hmm. because that show is four days a week and those deadlines are insanely tight. Mm. You have no room to miss them, yeah. pretty much none. And when you start your career at, at that level where it's like, oh, I have, I'm, I'm already terrified that I work at this place that's so intimidating with talented people, you know, literally clinging to the walls. And now I have to write at that level in an hour. You write, you roughly have an hour to turn in your script from the time it's conceived of mm. to the time it has to go into production that day. And so wow. when you watch the Daily Show with Jon Stewart and you see, you know, that first eight minute segment of the show in that first act, someone wrote that first draft in about an hour. <laughs> and and that's the level in which you have to work. And there is no, that's, that show is taped live to tape, 6 p.m. every day, 
There is no missing the deadlines. There is no time to waste. And when you do that for years, 162 episodes a year, mm -hmm. you find yourself just, someone gives you a deadline and you're like, here we go. I know how to hit this. Um, Cause you also, oh. at the time you're like afraid to miss it, <laughs> even though like you, you won't like, lose your job but someone's going to be beating down your door like hey turn that script in and so you know I just got into the habit of always turning my script in on time or being done like a couple days before it was due so that I could even sit with it and and I feel like I'm working myself up to get to the point that you're talking about where I have the 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 power or the ability to say to a studio you know, I'm going to turn this in when it's ready <laughs> or say to a network. I'm going to turn this in when I feel like it's ready. Not, you know, I'm racing to a deadline because I work for some other showrunner or work for some, uh, you know, under, I'm still trying to prove myself. Whereas like, I imagine if Sorkin says I need another week, he gets another week. <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to tell him no and, and, or anything like that. And so, you know, that's just where I find myself, you know, I definitely, do a lot of pre-thinking emotionally about, you know, what the thing is. I find myself writing a lot in my head before I actually sit down to do it mm -hmm. on the page. And um, it's also probably why I end up writing things before I pitch them or doing some work on it before I go out with it because I know when it has no pressure, no deadline, I can commit to spending more of the emotional time with it and not the speed at which it needs to be written um, situation. So you know, I, I try to balance both, but yeah, you're right. I definitely like, you give me a deadline, I'm, I'm gonna nail it. Yeah, <laughs> you've proven that you do well with, uh, with limitations. And you know, a lot of people feel like that's a part of, of uh, an important part of, of art. And uh, I, I wanted to, uh, hear more about your working process with Martin. Yeah, I mean, you know, Martin is such a great, a great partner. He's such a great asset to, to anyone because he has the ability to, to hear what you say and to, to channel what you want and make it come to life so perfectly. Like he's, it's just, it's, He's so in tune. He's such a gifted director and gifted filmmaker that he just knows how to convey emotion on screen, how to find it on the page, and how to expertly execute it and edit. And I don't know if I could have done this as well with anyone else that I know of, that I have any type of connection to in that way, because we were already, you know, working on a film together, and it just felt natural um, to to do this together. And we wanted to go on this journey together, especially as a, a test of our ability to work together, because we were working on a feature together. And this was the perfect, you know, trial run for that experience, where it was just mm. so egoless, and we never, we didn't have a single argument or fight <laughs> about wow. anything. It was all forward motion, all love, all the time. And, you know, he, he's just so, so incredible at getting shit done and getting it done well and fast. He's great at calculating, you know, in any situation, in any hiccup, what do we move or change or, or shift in order to continue to properly execute the vision and, you know, I've learned from a lot of people, a lot of directors and this experience co-directing with him was like, it was a masterclass, it truly mm -hmm. was. And, you know, we both brought uh, different assets to the table, but blended together, they created the movie that you see. And it was, it was incredible. And I hope we make many more things together. Yes. Same here. I hope to see many more things from you. So you'd say that together you're greater than the sum of your parts. Is that accurate? Oh, absolutely. I don't. I don't think I could have executed this, you know, to this level without 
Martin and everyone at Dirty Robber and everyone at now this, you know, Mickey Meyer and, you know, Lawrence Bender and uh, James Samuel was so instrumental into, you know, creating this film and Samir Hernandez, like the list of names goes on, Nick, Van, everyone poured everything they had last summer hmm. into getting this film made and getting it on screen. And, you know, it, when it got, when it got brutally just exhausting and difficult everyone always buckled down in the fact of like we're doing this for a reason this movie mm -hmm. is bigger than all of us yes. and if if we can just get this what we feel on screen and people feel it we've accomplished our goal and you know i can't i can't thank jessica young our dp is so amazing mm -hmm. so talented and you know uh, nick frew just an amazing uh, music supervisor and editor and, and, and graphic designer and just a brilliant thinker like everyone Alex Oldsmith our editor who I mean God someone hire him like hmm. the the pacing and the, the 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 amazing edit you see on screen is a testament to his gift and you know I'm he's someone I'm like hey I want you to just edit everything I make <laughs> yeah because because you are an, an incredible talent and um, you know, James Poyser, our, our, our composer, everyone brought something so special and unique to this film to make it possible. And everyone did it for pretty much free, like for almost nothing, because we just couldn't afford to be, you know, to do this and also ask for the salaries we deserved for it. You know, we're making a short film about a subject matter that is so, so emotional and so raw and so of the moment. And it's because we care about it that we're doing this. And so nobody, we weren't, you know, poor or broke or anything and in desperate need of money. So we put our time on the line and we told a story that we felt needed to be told and everybody just delivered at the highest level. Our entire crew was amazing. Everyone was. Well, Trayvon, again, uh, enormous congratulations. Uh, it's just an incredible story and in a lot of ways, how it came together included. So, um, you know, wishing you the best of luck and uh, hope I get to see you one of these days in LA. Yeah. And um, okay. yeah, and, and just looking forward to, uh, to seeing where this incredible journey goes. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. You're welcome. Thank you.